John Heyman of the New York Post, our baseball insider, joins us now. And I want to try this new segment with John called Around the Bases. And I'm going to give you four topics, John, and let you talk about those four things. And first up, let's get right into it. Jacob DeGrom, he left the Mets this past offseason to join the Texas Rangers. You talked to him. What would you take away from that? Yeah, I went to Rangers camp in uh, Surprise, Arizona, out here with a little trepidation because I had called him uh, – America's highest paid part-time worker several times in the New York Post. And, you know, I, I do think he does read uh, the Post. So uh, I was a little worried about the reaction. It actually was quite good. There was uh, one Ranger executive who wasn't thrilled with my coverage and mentioned that to me. And I, I don't blame him, frankly. I I was a bit tough on, on DeGrom, but DeGrom was fantastic. He said, I, John, as he walked past me at the beginning, gave me 10 minutes alone uh, the other writers, the Ranger writers, had gone off to the, see the game. I had seen him pitch, and, you know, he looked fantastic. He really looked great. Uh, his, you know, you can really tell the difference in the bullpen between Jacob deGrom and a, a mere mortal. He's incredible. And in terms of uh, the interview, um, you know, he was like – I hadn't seen him in, in years, really. Uh, you know, he said that he was – it was not about New York. He doesn't dislike New York. He has friends there. He has good memories in New York. Uh, he wasn't upset about the contract. It was his decision to sign the contract. So that wasn't it. Uh, not upset at the Mets organization. I mean, I gave him his say. You know, I, I think I owed it to him after my coverage, and I gave him his say. And, uh, you know, you can take it for what it's worth. You know, he said those are misconceptions. He did not hate New York, did not hate the contract. He did change agents, so I'm a little – not so sure if he's uh, telling 100% on the contract, but, you know, well, we had the impression that he seemed miserable last year. I don't know whether it's because he was hurt a lot, uh, whether there was the pressure of the platform year and having to, you know, go out and prove himself uh, or whatever. But he says that he liked New York and he didn't mind the contract. And he didn't say whether he liked me, but he did talk to me for 10 <laughs> minutes. So I was pretty, pretty excited about that. And I, I give him credit for doing so. We'll all be paying attention to how DeGrom does his first season in Texas. Next up, I got to talk about Los, the Anaheim Angels. Mike Trout had some comments about this is a big year. Obviously, everyone's paying attention to Shohei Otani becoming a free agent after this upcoming season. He says he wants to have a great year and keep Otani there in the Angels organization. What do you make of that? Yeah, I, I noticed you hesitated. I don't know whether to call Los Angeles Angels or the Anaheim Angels, the Orange <laughs> County. When I covered them, they were the California Angels. That's how old I am. They change their name every few years. So who knows what it is? But they are in Orange County. That'd be fine. They are in Anaheim. That's fine. They want to call themselves the Los Angeles Angels. Well, you can call yourself whatever you want. So it's okay, too. <laughs> um, you know, Mike Trout is great. Uh, he's been always been great with me from, the day, from when he was a rookie to now. And, uh, you know, he said that this is the year. This is the year they're going to do it. He knows it's been nine years. He reads his stuff on the Internet. Mike Trout better get to the playoffs. So generally he wants to get to the playoffs for him, for Anaheim, Los Angeles, wherever it is, for the Angels organization, and to try to keep Otani. Now, he basically just said to me, we want to do it to give him something to think about. If you really listen to that, what does that tell you? If they don't make the playoffs, they know he's a goner. If they do make the playoffs, they're just giving them something to think about. And they have some sort of chance. That said, you know, if they make it, it's still only one out of six years they've made it with him there. Mm. And uh, I think that people around baseball think that there's a good chance that he will leave. He does seem to have that West Coast preference based on five of the seven finalists from five years ago on the West Coast. The other two were the Cubs and the Rangers, not on the East Coast. He told the Yankees flat out, and he didn't see himself in New York. Now, that was five years ago. His handlers are going to say, you know, that's a long time ago. He's had his chance to go around baseball. He'll consider it. You know, obviously, Steve Cohn has got the money to do it and uh, certainly would love to have Otani, I'm sure. Uh, I think being out here, I do think the Dodgers did cut uh, 30, 40 million out of their payroll. They clearly have the wherewithal to do it. And they're a perennially winning team. They're only 45 miles away from Anaheim or Orange County, whatever you want to call <laughs> it. So uh, to me, the Dodgers are probably the favorite and that probably hurts the Angels to say that or hear that or know that, but that's probably the honest truth. Uh, Giants obviously will be in there. Padres, of course, they will spend and spend, and I don't know where they're getting it, but good for them. They want to win. 
And I mean, those are the main teams to me, the Giants, Angels, Padres, Mets. You'll see others in there too, Mariners, probably the Rangers. They like to spend as well. Uh, you know, who wouldn't be interested in him? He is the best player in the game. Quite possibly the biggest free agent in baseball history that we're going to see this upcoming offseason. And we're going to see probably a record-setting contract with Otani. Going to third, and I got to ask you, speaking out there on the West Coast, the Dodgers took a huge blow when Gavin Lux tore his ACL. Uh, the, the Padres aren't going anywhere, obviously, John. Are you concerned about the Dodgers? And obviously they lost Trey Turner, but are you concerned about them this upcoming season? I am. And, you know, it's somewhat about shortstop. And Gavin Lux, it's a big blow for him personally. He was slated to be the starting shortstop to take over for Trey Turner. I think he's a very good offensive player. I think he would be solid defensively. Uh, the Dodgers did have the – foresight uh, to bring in Miguel Rojas, who was a very good defensive player with the Mar Marlins he'd been. And, you know, he's not going to play the WBC now. He's going to prepare to be a starter for the Dodgers. They have Chris Taylor there to back up, and they like him as a shortstop as well. Does not appear they're going to go outside. Now, we'll see, I could be proven wrong. Not a lot left. There's Jose Iglesias left. It sounds like they're probably going to go with the Rojas and Taylor. They did sign Brigman, a longtime minor leaguer, as another backup. Uh, it's certainly a blow. The bigger question, the bigger issue for me with the Dodgers, obviously they lost a lot of players, Turner and Tyler Anderson and Justin Turner, two Turners. All over the field they lost. They lost 10 guys. And, uh, you know, they're now projected to win 96 games, which is still a very good team. And, you know, I think that's a little strong. I think they're very good. Uh, to me, the Padres, who I've seen some projections at lower than yeah. 96, to me, the Padres are the better team on paper right now. Uh, you know, they've got a set closer with Hayter. They've got a great setup man with Suarez, who we saw against the Mets in the playoffs. Uh, you know, that lineup is crazy good, particularly when Tatis joins them. Uh, Machado, Soto, Bogarts. Uh, you know, they have four superstars at the top of that lineup. Uh you know, they're having a lot of fun. I've been in their camp the last couple of days, and uh, they're really enjoying it. Uh, Soto, at least until today, barely made it out. He really looks locked in already. Uh, I don't know if he's on a salary drive or what, but, uh, you know, he may have the record contract too. Uh, Otani could get the record contract, or it could be Soto, although, you know, he's got <laughs> Scott Boris. He's got two years to go. Not going to call that likely. I know the Padres will try, <laughs> but you know they're they're really a star-studded team. And uh, to me, I think it's the Padres' year. You know, I, the Dodgers took a little bit of a step back, not a big one. I still think they're going to be in the playoffs, but to me, the Padres are the team to watch. It's going to be fascinating to see how that West plays out. And finally, let's bring it all home. The new rules were implemented, obviously, for baseball. What are you taking away from seeing game action thus far? First of all, I'll say that I'm biased because, you know, I work in a newspaper, uh, the finest <laughs> newspaper in the land, the New York Post, and we have deadlines like every other newspaper. And to have games that are gonna, now going to be an average of two and a half hours instead of three hours, and that's the way it's generally playing out here, uh, that's great for the stories. And I hope the readers will appreciate that. And it certainly will make my life easier. I'll be a little bit less nervous uh, for the night games. And uh, that'll be great. And I, I think it's good for the fans. And that's really what mm -hmm. this is about. I, I think to have action, to trim fat out of the game, I, I think it's better. I've talked to several old-time players who don't love it. You know, I went to dinner with Chili Davis out here, and he said, you know, we're going to miss the cat-mouse game of the batter and the pitcher. Well, the players may miss that. They may like that. But I, I don't think that most fans are that interested in the cat-mouse game. I think they probably like the David Ortiz and he's retired now, routine of, you know, putting everything together and all that. And I mean, you know, if, if you're all as old as I am, you'll remember Mike Hargrove, the human rain delay. I mean, it was kind of interesting <laughs> to watch how long that he took. And certainly no more Garcia Parra. It seems to be a lot of Red Sox. And I did talk to Xander Bogarts about this. And he did say the Red Sox people need to will need to adjust. They, they are the slowest players around, as we've seen with those Yankee uh, Red Sox game. And the game that I – one of the games I went to – uh, Bogarts did get a, a time violation and he was rushing to catch a plane that day. So that's something you're not going to see a guy getting a time, taking too much time when he needs to catch a plane. He's now often <laughs> joining his Netherlands team uh, for the world baseball classic, but 
Certainly, guys will need to adjust. We saw Miguel Cabrera get uh, rung up for a violation. Manny Machado, he kind of laughed it off. He said, I'll start a lot of counts 0-1. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, he's still going to be pretty good starting 0-1. But to me, the clock is what everybody's talking about out here in Arizona. And I'm sure that's true in Florida as well. I think it's going to take time to figure out exactly how the banning of the shift is going to play out. It's certainly it's going to help Corey Seager, Max Muncy, the power hitting lefty who's not necessarily that fast. Right. Uh, it'll be right. interesting to see how uh, a Freeman, Freddie Freeman, or a uh, Jeff McNeil. I mean, they were great at figuring out where to hit the ball uh, with the shift. Uh, and now we'll see what they can do. But they're such good hitters, such good contact hitters that I think they'll figure out a way to be just as good, but certainly it's going to be a boon to guys like Muncy, Seager, and other guys like that. And uh, you're going to see more steals, and I think that's great for the game as well. One of the games I went to, Tati stole on the second pitch. He was on second, first base, and uh, you know it's interesting that he's playing when he's under suspension. But I guess they want him to be healthy when he does is able to come back and play. And uh, you know, I think the game is going to be more exciting. It's going to be faster paced and it's going to be better for us at the newspaper. Yeah. And I think, like you said, it's, it keeps you on the edge of your seat a little bit more because you're paying attention and the, you know, the ball is going to get pitched and, it, and more actions happening in these games. Listen, this is John Aim and this new segment around the bases. Appreciate you guys giving us all the news and stories that are going around in baseball and hoping to talk to you soon, man. Appreciate you as always. All right, Ryan. Good talking to you. 